Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is Thursday, July the 20th, 2023. Oppenheimer Day, the movie starts today. I'm going to be seeing it. We're doing all sorts of shows about it. A unique moment of supposedly a unique American history. Uh, we did a show yesterday with Evan Thomas, the distinguished contemporary historian of America. His new book, Road to Surrender, deals with the American decision to drop an atomic weapon onto Japan. Um, all a consequence, of course, of Pearl Harbor, another very unique event, seemingly. And Earlier today, we just did a show with another historian, Sean Mursky. We may dominate the world about American foreign policy between the Civil War and 1945. All approach history, and particularly American history, in a very unique way. Separate, uh, bound up, not with periods or repetition, but with facts themselves. My guest today, though, um, I think has a different way of thinking about history. Uh, Neil Howe is the co-author of a huge best-selling book, The Fourth Turning, An American Prophecy, back in 1997. He also wrote with um, with Neil, uh, with William Strauss, uh, a book called Generations, which has had a huge impact on how we think about uh, the generational quality of American culture and politics and history. And he's back again with a new book. It's just out this week. The Fourth Turning is here. It's the second chapter in his analysis of The Fourth Turning. Uh, it's written on his own. Unfortunately, William Strauss is no longer around. And he's joining us now from Great Falls, Virginia, where he lives. Um, Neil, congratulations on the book. Uh, Tell me a little bit about how you think in history, in contrast with traditional historians who think in very factual terms. You seem to imagine history is bound up in repetition, a kind of seasonal analysis of, of, of the nature of history. Yeah, well, uh, I uh, certainly like to think that I'm uh, uh, very closely tied to factual analysis. I mean, you know, looking at facts is all that an historian has, right? So um, I do think, however, that the purpose of studying history is to get some idea of the broader rhythms that uh, influence uh, the, and, and the broader patterns that, 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 that kind of guide our social life. Um, for history to be of any use, as opposed to just an antiquarian shop full of, you know, fascinating knickknacks, right? We need to be able to discern some patterns in history. Um, and I think one, one thing that, that Bill and I did originally when we wrote Generations uh, a long time ago, back in 1991 and uh, subsequent books, was, um, was looking at the power of, the, uh, of generational formation in history. And the fact that generations shaped by history as children and coming of age later on, 30 or 40 years later, go on to shape history, right? So it's, it's sort of a complete cycle there. And that, uh, and that, and that generations then uh, are shaped differently and they continue to have, you know, hold those differences, both in behaviors and personalities that grow older and that those are determinative of history itself. And when you look at history, you see that, that generations don't just arrive at random. There's a certain pattern in how they arrive, and that pattern gives rise to some of the large patterns we see in history itself. Um, and that really has been uh, the focus of, of, of you know, my work uh, with Bill and now alone without Bill um, for you know, throughout, throughout these many books. And I, I would say that the basis of our analysis is the study of generational formation. Um, we, you know, we were, um, we wrote generations back in 1991. We, we coined the, the term millennial generation back then when no one was really thinking about, uh, you know, those kids um, who are just growing up in the, in the shadow of generation X. And, and I think that a lot of, 
what we forecasted for these different cohort groups uh, largely came to be. Uh, you know, back in 1991, we were predicting that this generation would be considered themselves special. They would be protected. They would be more team oriented and community oriented than, than the generation that came before them. Uh, that they would have a, a great deal more um, orientation sort of to rebuilding sort of the outer institutions of our of our uh, of our society rather than just you know fixating on 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 vision and values and uh, in other words a more left brained orientation and I think a lot of what we talked about uh, later came to be. Um, overcoming a lot of, you know, skepticism of some of our early readers. But, but uh, yes, that is, that is our overall orientation. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting way of doing history, looking for those broader rhythms and patterns, and particularly in a generational sense. Let's go back to uh, Oppenheimer. I haven't seen the movie yet. I'm seeing it later today. I'm guessing it will touch on our age of anxiety and worry and sense perhaps of American decline, uh, immorality, America's role in the world. In the context of your fourth turning and your analysis of the, the generational nature of history, um, Neil, compare the America of Oppenheimer in 1945, the America that invented and then dropped the first nuclear weapon, with the America of July 2023, the America of Donald Trump, fear, anxiety, Twitter, the internet, and so on and so forth. Well, you know, that was a that was a, uh, a it's, it's interesting how that fourth turning ended. We, we think we're in a very similar era today, right? Um, although at the time that Oppenheimer made his decision and worked with his crew uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Manhattan Project uh, to design a weapon of mass destruction, that was sort of the end of the climax of our last fourth turning. Uh, we're still in the middle of it, right? The climax is ahead of us. And so that gives you some idea of where we see uh, ourselves again in the winter season of history and looking forward to um, a, a, uh, this period of, 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 of growing tension, uh, conflict, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and crisis, which will resolve you know, sometime probably at the end of, the, of this coming decade. And one thing they look about is the social mood at the time in uh, 1943 and 44 and 45, a time when the nation was perfectly comfortable recruiting the best and the brightest young people and young people were eager to join in a mission to build a weapon of mass destruction which at that time the nation promptly put to use. And uh, Oppenheimer had, may have had doubts about it later, but I don't think America had any doubts about it at the time, least of all uh, President Truman, who didn't even know about the project while he was vice president and uh, you know, learned about it after, mm. after he assumed the presidency and had no doubt when he heard the news at Potsdam that this uh, had been, the machine had been perfected that he would put it to use and possibly um, save the lives of, um, of uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, not only of Americans, but Japanese by making the decision to use it. Let, let's go back to, um, to, to the notion of the fourth turning. Marx, of course, famously noted, that, who also seemed to think like you in broader rhythms and patterns. He invented a science of an anal analyzing history, which he borrowed from Hegel. He called it dialectical materialism. Um, Mark <coughs> noted that history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as farce. Your notion of a fourth turning happens time and time again. Uh, it doesn't just happen once. Could you explain exactly what it means uh, it, it, history is made up of these these four turns and then it repeats itself what what is a turning and, and why are there four of them well let, let me just sort of explain what a lot of historians have have noticed and sometimes have mused about and that is is that if you go back and look at sort of 
you know, Anglo-American history writ large, going all the way back, you find this kind of curious um, phenomenon whereby these great moments of civic upheaval and institutional renewal in American history and, and going back, obviously, in, in sort of, you know, British, British or English history as well, <clears throat> tend to come about every long human lifetime. I mean, we had, you know, going way back, even in colonial America, we actually start back in the 15th century. But if you look at the, you know, the glorious revolution in, in, in Britain and, um, uh, and the, the period, you know, revolutionary quarter century in the colonies in the late 17th century, and then go ahead another long human lifetime, you know, 80, 90 years, you get to the American Revolution, and then you go ahead the same length of time, you get to the Civil War, and you go ahead, you get to the Great Depression, World War II, and then today, you know, here we are again, right? And, and interestingly, about halfway in between these big outer world civic events, you have these phenomenal inner world events, which uh, uh, historians of, of religion and, and culture have paid a lot of attention to. These are the great awakenings of American history, right? These are these periods of sort of spiritual revival and upheaval which we actually number in American history. We call them the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and so on. Many historians have called the late 1960s and 1970s America's fourth or fifth great awakening. Yeah, we've done a number of shows on, on those. They're all richly interesting. <clears throat> but what's really interesting here, uh, Andrew, is that you have a certain pattern, right? You have a period of sort of outer world upheaval, and then about half a lifetime later, about 40, 45 years later, you have a period of inner world upheaval, right? And you kind of go back and forth. And, and what we think that's related to is a very interesting alternation in the creation of generations. Um, and we, we actually give these generations archetypal names. You know, we, a generation that's born after a crisis and comes of age with the awakening, we call it a prophet archetype. And boomers would be an example of that. And they typically are entering old age right at the time of the next outer world crisis. You see how that works. And similarly, a generation born after an awakening is typically a more outer world community and you know, technology focused and outer world focused generation. Uh, and, and we would say the millennial generation would be of that type. We also think that the, what was later called the greatest generation, or in America, we call them the GI generation, was also of that type, you know, coming of age, not just with the Great Depression, but with the 19, uh, 1939 World's Fair and the glorification of technology as a way to solve the world's ills, particularly technology uh, spread out and actuated and scaled up on a massive uh, I wonder, a, a couple of thoughts, uh, Neil, on this analysis. Firstly, you, you noted that this tends to be an Anglo-American phenomenon. It's a, a Whiggish <laughs> version of history. Not all cultures seem to go through this. Is it unique to white men like yourself and myself and, and your, uh, your, your co-author, um, uh, well, we, who's no we, longer, unfortunately, around, uh, we, near, uh, William Strauss? Is there something sort of... In, in terms of the analysis, are, are certain cultures, do they lend themselves better or worse to these fourth turning? We think, it's an, we think it's an attribute of modernity itself. That is to say, it's an attribute of societies that begin to think of themselves as progressive. Um, well, you're dodging is, the question there a little bit. I mean, well, no, I'm, I'm about to answer your question. <laughs> I'm getting there. If you live, let me let me, let me go there. Right. So we think it's an aspect of modernity itself. And as more and more of the world begins to think of itself as modern, it encompasses more and more of the world. Look, the last fourth turning we had, the Great Depression and World War II was a global event. Uh, it not only influenced the entire you know, Anglophone world and, and Western Europe, it impacted Southern Asia, India, China, the entire you know, East Asian uh, 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 world, uh, uh, Latin America as well. And I would say also that the, the events, the youth upheaval of the late 60s and 70s was to some extent a world event. It, it occurred not just in, you know, Berkeley and, and, and Columbia University, but, you know, Paris, 
uh, 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 Milan, uh, Berlin, but also Tokyo, uh, Beijing, Buenos Aires, and much of the world. We think that the, that the generational rhythm is encompassing a larger and larger part of the globe. And I, I do spell that out, actually. This is one thing that we didn't cover as much in the fourth turning of a book you know, we wrote you know, some 20 odd years ago, but I spend more time with that uh, in, this, in this book. So let's get to the new book. The fourth turning is here. What the seasons of history tell us about how and when the crisis, this crisis, will end. What what crisis, Neil? Well, what crisis exactly are you talking about? Well, I think everything we noticed today, uh, the increasing uh, palpable pessimism uh, by the public around the world about their future, uh, economic, political, civic. I mean, I track that. Uh, uh, every day, you know, as part of my day job for our clients. Um, and I think it's occasioned by the fact that uh, living standards for most of the population have stopped rising, particularly for younger people. Younger people are giving up on democracy. Uh, this is the finding of the uh, Cambridge uh, uh, Institute for the Study of Democracy, which said not just in high income countries, but around much of the world. Uh, younger generations no longer care about democracy. It's an excuse to uh, just keep sclerotic and dysfunctional political institutions going and to uh, avoid changing anything uh, in a way that would favor young people in the future. But we also see it in the rise of authoritarian populism around the world. Uh, you know, VDAM and Freedom House, you know, tracking the share of the population living in free societies peak right around uh, the eve of the Great Recession, right? The, the, uh, the global financial crisis, it's been falling ever since. And by the way, that's kind of where we date the beginning of this fourth turning would be the GFC. Similarly, global, uh, uh, global trade as a share of total global product peaked right around that. It's been falling ever since. Uh, and the world is splitting up into, into a, a, a greater sense of autarky, a greater sense of regional trade zones, that more, most recently fostered not just by the pandemic, but by uh, you know, the, the sanctions occasioned by the Ukraine war. Um, we have, look, 10 years ago in America, the, the subject of civil war and secession was so remote that no one even did polls on it. Today, half of Americans think a civil war is imminent. We now have uh, not only a proxy war, you know, major land war in Europe, but increasing fears of a war in the, in the Western Pacific. So we are in a period when the public not only sees these events, but increasingly feels alarmed by them and I think it's not just that we're in a fourth turning. I think increasingly America feels like it's in a fourth turning. Uh, that is to say, a period in which, you know, quite unlike the late 1990s when people talked about the end of history, uh, you know, powerful governments would wither away, uh, people today feel that, you know, large uh, uh, dictatorial uh, institutional life. Is is growing to play a larger form, a larger uh, play, playing a larger role in our life, and is uh, and is uh, uh, taking us uh, in, in a taking taking the world in a very negative direction, uh, uh, and and this is this this is a radicalizing mood, meaning people are increasingly willing to vote for radical solutions uh, to to solve their problems. What's the politics of all this when you say that the perception of decline is, is, is conformed, uh, confirmed in, in the reality? Both liberals and conservatives have embraced uh, your work. Steve Bannon famously uh, loved uh, uh, your work, uh, and I think he, he made a, a movie about it. But uh, Al Gore also likes it. Do you see a, a politics here, or why does it attract both? Hardcore conservatives, reactionaries, opponents of democracy like Bannon, and environmentalists like Al Gore. 
I, uh, yeah, I look, I think uh, we live in an era when people think that politics as usual will not, will not save us. Um, and I think the, the, the threshold moment for that in America was the 2016 election uh, when, uh, you know, Donald Trump, you know, upset Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton kind of stood for, uh, you know, the establishment, the experts. Uh, let's just run everything according to orthodox solutions. Trump, for better or for worse, represented something, you know, radically different. Uh, and as a result, it's led America into its next uh, realigning political event, because I think the constituents of the two parties have been reshuffling themselves. And we only have these realignments about once every 40 years or so. So this was something we expected. And it's something I write about in my book, that is to say, the roots of realigning elections, which don't occur very often. The, the last one we had was in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, when the Republicans took over the South. Uh, and before that, we had it in the, in the mid uh, 1930s uh, with, with FDR, the rise of the New Deal and the dominance of the Democratic Party after you know, several decades after the Civil War when the Democrats were, were virtually invisible in American political life. So we, 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 we also have this pattern of realignments and we think that that's also in sync with the, uh, the cycle. Now, we don't know yet in America how that's going to play out, uh, which party is going to win. Uh, we think it's, uh, you know, at least I think it's very unlikely that the third party in this current environment has an opening. Um, you know, third parties typically uh, typically do much better in what we call the, the third turning, the unraveling, when people don't really take politics very seriously. That's when we had, you know, the, the, the huge uh, minority vote for Ross Perot, for example, back in the early 1990s. We don't think it's possible now simply because people think that their vote is too precious. If you don't, if your enemy wins, the country is lost forever. So people don't dare waste their vote, quote unquote, waste their vote on a third party candidate. So I think the real issue here, here is which party is going to retool itself to gain an advantage? Uh, because the current sort of 50-50 balance that you see, which is highly unstable and has really prevented government from be acting and certainly prevented Congress from really making many decisions uh, does not seem sustainable for long. Neil, your, your grandfather was an astronomer. He looked at the universe. So you're continuing in the family tradition of observing very distant things. But of course, the universe doesn't think for itself. It doesn't determine its future. Sometimes in the way and you present history, I'm not suggesting you're a Marxist, God forbid, but um, you seem to suggest that these cycles are inevitable. What's the role of human agency in all this? I mean, the fourth turning is here. How do we determine it? How do we shape this fourth turning? How do we make sure that it ends well rather than badly? You, you said it yourself, Andrew. Uh, you said it very accurately. That's exactly what human agency does, is to make sure it ends well and not badly. Fourth turnings can end very badly. And I give examples in history of fourth turnings which have ended catastrophically. You know, the, the, the Taiping Rebellion in, in, in China, right, in the, in the 1850s and 60s, which maybe, you know, cost the lives of 40 or 50 million people. Or what happened in, in, in Russia and in the Soviet Union, you know, from, you know, World War I through the end of World War II it was, was a catastrophe, right? I mean, that's an example of catastrophe. We need to make sure that this fourth turning ends well. So a, a cycle of history is not determinative. It doesn't mean that we're going to have another golden age at the end of it. It could mean that. And actually, that's part of the good news of my message. And I, I haven't emphasized to people, people think, oh, you, you, this is so gloomy. And I say, no, actually, it enables us to actually have a time when we have a period of creative destruction and we recreate, we rejuvenate our political and civic institutions so they can again serve the interests of the future and the young. This is not ultimately bad news, but it, it, it is a dangerous time, Andrew. So I do agree with you that the danger is, is that it turns out very badly 
and uh, the future suffers for it. That is up to our agency to make sure it ends well and not badly. I think of your, your and I, uh, my generation, Neil, we're relatively similar generations. I'm not sure how much of an impact we're going to have. What about the younger generation? I've got kids. I'm not sure if you have them. One of the striking things to me, making generalizations, which you do, is the anxiety that seems to have afflicted the young generation. I'm not sure whether to call them millennials. I'm not sure what word to use. You're the expert on that. But it seems as if young people today are really traumatized by the world, sometimes justifiably, sometimes otherwise. They, they're almost apocalyptic. How would you explain that? Is that a, a fairly familiar part of your analysis of history? Oh, and I, how I, does that generation um, emancipate itself from this apocalyptic way of thinking about things which undermines their own agency? I mean, look, th this is a, a young adult generation where all the institutions which used to help you uh, in life, you know, from from family to courtship to employment to, uh, uh, you know, community has been stripped away from them. You know, they just have these these extras on top of them telling them to join the hustle economy and just work harder. You know what I mean, Andrew? I mean, the, the, the everything that used to structure their lives has gone and they're they're going on websites and reading about you know adulting 101 because our extra and boomer parents never taught us how to be an adult we have to figure it out from scratch do you have kids as, I, as I, that result, sounds like a cliche i mean do you have kids yourself oh i have a lot of them yes good well my generation or our generation seems to be as one of the interesting things i think about the boomer generation is obsessive parents obsessed with preparing our kids perhaps over preparing our kids for the world well, we don't prepare institutions. What we do is we give them a lot of personal advice, but the institutions have all disappeared. That's the point, right? Um, the boomer, the, the parents of boomers were, were not terribly good at, you know, personally relating to their kids, but they, sp they spent a lot of energy making sure that all the institutions worked. So this is the difference. I totally agree with you that personally, Millennials are very close to their parents. In fact, one thing that I think, really, aren't they? Uh, they're not well, rebellious enough. Well, uh, excuse me. They're not rebellious enough. They dress the same. They listen to music. You know, that's, a stupid, but that's a stupid boomer complaint. I mean, you know, because for boomers, the norm is always that you should rebel against your parents, right? But boomers don't realize that they're one of the very few generations that did that, right? Most generations mm. don't do that. But for them, that'll always be the norm. So right now, boomers are constantly complaining about our young kids. This is what millennials are about. They're not about rebelling against their parents. They're about creating an ordered world. That sense of anxiety you talk about, that sense of exhaustion, that sense of constantly taking... Um, uh, you know, Ritalin and Adderall, you know, well into your 30s because you constantly have to be on to perform all the time because nothing around you in your institutional life is supporting you is leading this generation to become an order seeking generation in civic life and politics. And that's really a very important part of understanding the dynamics of the fourth turning and why it ends up in a more ordered civic and political life than we had at the beginning. Is it and a turning inwards as well? I'm always a, trying to encourage my children to have more sex, and I think they think I'm slightly odd, which I am, of course. Um, what is it about this generation that's turned them inward, turned them away from sex, from partying, from having fun? <laughs> uh, such a boomer question. Well, I'm a boomer. Um, so are you. Yeah, you? I understand it. Oh, no, you're a post-boomer. No, I'm a boomer too, but uh, I, we, can I can we escape our own generation, Neil? I, I certainly hope so, and 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 that's what I try to do in my work. I look, I, I look at and as a parent, I hope, and as a parent, I look at I look at all generations as uh, you know, in 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 the words of von Ranke, you know, the great 19th century historian, as as equally justified before God. I mean, they all they all come into a world which was not chosen by them. And they try to make sense of it as best mm. they can. And 
our analysis is that each generation, you know, tends to tends to um, tends to push society in the right direction given where society is at the time. The this turnings analysis, the seasonal analysis of history, has a has a rationale. It's it's a an adaptive complex system that pushes society through these seasons so it's better able to adapt and survive. And unfortunately, the fourth turning, this period of creative destruction, is one of those necessary phases. Um, you know, forests need fires occasionally, uh, rivers need floods. Uh, society needs these periods of, of, of a disruption. Now, now, you're, now you're beginning to sound like Steve Bannon. So you've talked about, um... Well, yeah, the crisis of institutions that there aren't institutions which we baby boomers had. What kind of institutions need to be built in this forthcoming for it to turn out well? Well, in uh, in chapter eight of the book, you know, we talk about the fourth turning as a social process, and I talk about the 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 main dynamic that occurs is from you know individualism to community. I mean, if you think about where the world changed, Andrew, from the late 1920s, you know, to the early 1950s, I think that was one of the big trajectories, individualism to community. Uh, and in fact, Robert Nisbet, you know, who wrote The Quest for Community, was, was absolutely astonished at the beginning of the 1950s about everyone in America uh, was rhapsodizing the values of community. That's where we are going to end up right, at the end of this period. But that's not all. There are several other transformations that are going to occur. The other is from privilege to equality. This will be a more equal world in terms of wealth and income, in terms of just measuring by the Gini coefficient. <clears throat> the, um, to some extent, you can see that already beginning to occur in the, in the wake of the pandemic, but that will occur even faster during the period of crisis and, and uh, and 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 uh, a public mobilization that will follow. It will be a period also from rebellion to authority, and that's also something you saw from the late twenties to the early fifties. People will have greater trust in official institutions, and that's one. That's one of the things. I, I don't did. see much evidence. One of the things. A bit more concrete. What what are these institutions? You talk about New Deal institutions. Government. The state the government. One of the things boomers hated about the 1950s was that everyone, all their parents and everyone around them trusted it so much. What they hated about the 1950s was the strong middle class, right? It forced everyone into these conformist molds. And you ask millennials today, Andrew, and they're talking middle class, where is it? I want to join. I don't see it anywhere. Whereas boomers felt suffocated by the middle class. That's how much the world has changed. Um, another, another thing we're going to see is this, is this uh, shift from deferral to permanence. Today, we just defer problems. We don't solve them. In the coming first turning, which will follow the, the, the fourth turning, we'll, we'll be in that mood by the end of the, of the fourth turning, we will tip the, the institutional playing field again toward the young in the future, and we will build permanent institutions. We will build at least a sense of longer lasting institutions, particularly in the form of infrastructure and, and more adaptive programs that are more sustainable over the long term, unlike just you know, piling on debt and stimulus like we do today. And finally, we're gonna move the culture from irony toward convention. And again, if you look at previous you know, fourth turnings, you always see the same shift in the culture. So these are the broad shifts we're going to see, and um, inevitable. I, 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 it doesn't sound very promising to me. I don't want to live in a culture of conformity. But that, as you say, then I'm a. a yeah, a, well, a, you, you will be. You know, you're going to, you know. to us. We'll all be gone. We'll have left the stage. It, it all reminds me of that '60s song. Do you remember that song, uh, Neil? Turn, turn, turn. Uh, yes, that was. Uh... <laughs> That was uh, that was originally by Bob Dylan, and it was redone by a number of yeah, other. Yeah, I mean, Dylan was the quintessential boomer. Uh, uh, finally, um, what about the role of technology here? In all seriousness, um, some people see AI and biotech. We did a show about that yesterday. 
as the crisis itself. Some people see it as the way out of the crisis, the way of rebuilding or reinventing institutions. Um, we've never had AI before and some of these other revolutionary technologies coming out of Silicon Valley. Do you see technology as, as helping us make this new fourth turning more successful or is it the problem? I think that millennials will use technology to become a part of the solution. I don't think technology itself is good or bad. Uh, and in fact, uh, in, in my book, what I try to spell out is that technology usually gives generations alive at the time, whatever it is they want. It just gives them more of it. Um, and it's interesting to me that you know, back in the late 70s and 1980s, when boomers were coming of age and inventing the personal computer, you know, getting away from the mainframes of their parents, uh, everyone thought that that was what technology did. It individuates us. It frees us from big institutions. And you all, re I'm sure you remember, Andrew, the ad 1984 won't be like 1984. That was the famous Apple ad back then. Yeah. With the, with the you know, shattering the telescreen. And after that, I don't know how many presidents and political leaders we had telling us the microchip would liberate us from dictators and uh, you know oppressive governments all over the world, right? Ronald Reagan said that, Bill Clinton said that, G.W. Bush said that, but now that we're in a fourth turning, dictators and authoritarian leaders around the world love technology, right? They can, uh, they can mobilize mobs on social media. They can surveil their, 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 their population. How did technology suddenly change from an agent of individual liberation to an agent of authoritarian control? My thesis is, is that technology gives societies what they want at the time that they want it. So uh, technologies did not determine our direction. Technology is used by society to go wherever it is they want to go. And uh, you look back in the history, whether it's of television, radio, or anything else, technology is shaped by what society wants to do at the time. It's the medium and the message. Uh, and final question, actually, Neil, final, final question. You're a generational analyst. Um, it, it always sounds to me with these whole theories of millennials, particularly these days, is it's creating a, a cult of youth, the notion that young people know better than old people what they want. In, the, in your historical analysis of all these different turnings, should we go back to not so much a cult of youth, but a, a cult of old people, a cult of wisdom? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure that this is a great, you know, era of youth in the culture. Uh, I look at the movies today and they're all featuring, you know, 60 and 70 somethings in action movies. I mean, my God. Uh, Oppenheimer, right? <laughs> I mean, Harrison Ford and all these guys are still actually doing movies. Um, I actually find millennials are very deferential to uh, boomer culture. Uh, they know the White Album. They know the Beatles, the Eagles, you know, discography. They, they read their mom's whole earth guide. I mean, you know, the millennials are totally tuned into member culture. At the same age, Andrew, we wouldn't even know the slightest bit about our parents' culture, and we didn't care. Yeah, we I didn't talk to my it. parents for the first 40 years of my life. So, Well, there you go. I, I think, you know, case in point right there. But my point is, is that the boomer attitude toward their parents was much like Emerson's you know, I didn't give a thought to a conversation or an idea that my parents had because it wasn't worth paying attention to. And I think boomers are much the same. And I think by contrast, millennials are straining always to try to gain wisdom from their parents, which is why so many millennials are living with their parents and trying to, you know, imbibe what they can from them. Where millennials disagree with boomers is not that boomers aren't personally wise. I think millennials would defer to that. It's just boomers can't organize themselves outside out of a shoebox, right? But boomers, when it comes to any kind of collective activity, are uh, 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 fatally dysfunctional. And that millennials have to organize the new world themselves. In other words, defer to boomers for personal wisdom. But my God, when it comes to actually building things in the world, uh, you know, boomers should be told to, you know, take, you know, 
get your hands off it and slowly back up. You know, do, do not do this at home.